Hello everyone, my name is James Claiborne. I'm the Public Programming Manager at the African American Museum in Philadelphia. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's uh, program in partnership with AMP and Mural Arts Philadelphia. We're so excited to be joined by two incredible voices and artists, uh, Reginald Betts and Titus Kafar. Of course, tonight's program builds on a partnership between our museum and Mural Arts Philadelphia, uh, centered on a physical and digital virtual exhibition called Rendering Justice. Um, I'd like to thank the entire team of the African American Museum in Philadelphia, uh, our curator, DJ Duckett, Ivan Henderson, our VP of Programming, Alexandra Bingham, Richard Watson, Exhibitions, and the entire staff of the museum. We're so grateful for the work and the vision of Mural Arts and the artists, this incredible group of artists that are pulled together. Um, our, uh, our institution, as many know, sits across the street from a federal detention center. And so uh, we are always kind of thinking of the implications of the criminal justice system, uh, the way that is built upon centuries of inequities. Um, but I'm grateful for the vision of these artists that help us anchor ourselves to something, uh, uh, to movements of change uh, that, uh, that help us to imagine, to vision, uh, worlds uh, change, uh, change worlds. Um, and I'm excited that this work is here in Philadelphia. Um, and so uh, please visit uh, ampmuseum.org or Mural Arts, our website, to check out this incredible exhibition. Stay connected with our organizations. Um, and we do hope to welcome you into our space when uh, the moment allows. So without further ado, I want to turn over the stage and the mic to uh, my dear friend, uh, the executive director and founder of Mural Arts Philadelphia, Jane Golden. Thank you. James, thank you so much, and thank you for all you do, and really, we love the African American Museum, and you have provided us uh, with just a great, great home for this show, and you have for 25 years, and so um, thank you. And I want to say that I am so honored to be introducing two such esteemed artists, uh, both of whom I've admired for a really long time. Uh, Mural Arts is a community-based public art program. We sort of live in the nexus of the public, the private, the social, the civic, and the aesthetic. And while we create about 100 major works of art a year, uh, our rich programmatic divisions that span environmental justice, uh, behavioral health, our porch light program, art education, community development, and criminal justice are really what stirs our heart. And, um, is really the focus of so much energy and attention, and it's what drives and inspires us. And so it's in this area of criminal justice work that I got to meet Jesse Crimes. Uh, and uh, we've worked in prisons, we've worked in the state prison since 2002, we've been working in the county prisons, and then in 2008, we started a program for people who've been impacted by the criminal justice system. And the head of our restorative justice program uh, met Jesse Crimes on the inside and saw his work, and said what we say to people all the time, if you, you know, when you get out, please come to Mural Arts and you have a job. And so uh, we had a small reentry program back then and Jesse started working with us and clearly was so incredibly talented. Uh, it's a pre-apprenticeship program, it's called the Guild, where uh, people are impacting the city in big, bold, wonderful ways, creating public works of art. It's a jobs program, training program, you know, mentoring program. And uh, we try to provide people with a lot of love and a lot of support, uh, and it's incredibly inspiring. And Jesse's was followed by Russell Craig and so many other uh, people who are just enormously talented. Um, and it's been a profound honor to watch so many young adults in the Guild program go on to careers in the arts and other things. Just to see their lives flourish is really a thrill. Um, and so that's how we got to cross paths with Jesse. We then cross paths with him again, because besides being an artist, he's also a curator. And several years ago, he and Russell helped create this reimagining reentry fellowship program, a fellowship program for artists who've been impacted by the system. And uh, under uh, Jesse and Russell's direction, many, many artists were able to receive fellowships, thanks to Arts, Art for Justice. Art for Justice, we love you. And we were able to do another round of fellowships. And uh, Jesse had the idea that some of the artists in the fellowship program could also partner with someone if they chose to do so. Uh, connected 
with the fellowship program is a major exhibit at the African American Museum that's up there now. And also the idea that each fellow and uh, or fellow and their partner artist would do a work of public art in our city. So consequently, there's this wonderful exhibit and public art is appearing throughout Philadelphia. That is really exciting. And so I remember the day that Jesse called me and he said that uh, Dwayne Betts would be partnering with Titus Kapar. And I was like, what? Because I know the redaction series. And I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. Um, so I, I literally, like literally jumped for joy. So Titus and, and Reginald, thank you. So throughout their careers, visual artist and filmmaker Titus Kafar and memoirist, poet and attorney Reginald Dwayne Betts have confronted the abuses of the criminal justice system, grounding their explorations in various mediums. Their redaction series was originally on display at MoMA PS1 and examines the issue of money bail. The condition of the state and federal court system by which those who are arrested but are unable to afford bail remain incarcerated, even though they have been neither tried nor convicted. The print for portfolio, the redaction, their first artistic collaboration, advances this work by focusing on the ways that state and federal courts exploit and erase the poor and incarcerated from public consciousness. Betts mobilizes the legal strategy of redaction to craft poetry out of their complaints, while Kafar uses printmaking techniques to etch portraits of these individuals under the redacted texts. The redaction seeks to create a platform for mul multiple conversations about art, about poetry, and legal questions that can influence the outcomes and reflect current conversations around the issue of the criminal justice system and reform. Their most recent iteration of redaction is currently on display at the African American Museum, and I truly hope you can go see it when you walk upstairs and you see this wall. It is so stirring. The series includes moving portraits of our guild members and, th and thought-provoking redactions of the Declaration of Independence. And I'm really proud to say that their work is leading up to what I believe will be a monumental mural in our city based on one of the images in the show. So keep an eye out for that. It is coming in the spring and I'm a wall hunter and I want to tell you it's on a great wall at 15th and Cherry. It will be evocative, challenging, inspiring, exciting, and it'll be an incredible addition to the 4,000 murals that grace the sides of walls throughout our city. We are so thrilled to be here to discuss your work. It is now my great honor to introduce Titus Kafar and Reginald Dwayne Betts. Yeah, thank you for having us. That was a great introduction. And James, thank you for um, opening the show and welcoming uh, everybody here. So I guess, uh, yeah, I guess Titus, we're gonna chop it up for a minute and pretend like um, Mike, first, no, we're pretend like we in the same room and then we'll pretend like there's other people in the room <laughs> and not on Zoom. Let's do it. So I, I thought I would start by reading the, the, the piece that we used to sort of set up what this project was about and why we chose the Declaration of Independence and, um, and, then, and then move on from there. Yeah. Roughly 250 years ago, 56 people signed the Declaration of Independence. It was a contract, a promise, an explanation of what it means to demand freedom. Today, there are many in this country searching for that destination, as if freedom is a country, not their own. A declaration is an attempt to give voice to that desire. But more than that, it is an attempt to document the lives left out of that initial promise and reflect them engaging with what some with, with that same text, believing that the text is a map to the country it so describes. The notion of redaction isn't just about revision. It is about the effort to make things seen that have long been invisible. The distance from the aspirations of the Declaration of Independence to its realization has yet to be eclipsed but the desire to do so remains. An artist as a medium of the people works to make that desire understood and known to the world. And of course, this is about prison because the natural antithesis to freedom is prison. Where else would you find an embodiment of that desire outside of a prison cell um, felt so strongly? 
and I, I guess, you know, we do this and, 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 and we write this and it's strange because you get in a situation where um, we get doing something that as an artist, you don't always like, like do, right? Which is to try to uh, explain the intention behind your work. Yeah. But I wonder how you feel about that, even, even when, you know, when we were working on writing this statement, because I felt like I struggled with it, because as a poet, you know, the, the, the words speak for themselves. And I felt like any anytime I do something like this, it never captures fully what the work is trying to do. And I always wanted to ask you, like, uh, how do you respond to the need to create explanatory text for the projects that you work on by yourself and that we worked on together? It's... Sometimes it's, I mean, it's often really challenging. Sometimes words just come out, right? And they feel like their own poetic articulation, another uh, addendum to the painting itself. But generally that's not how it happens. Generally you make the work and you want the work to stand for what is ineffable, stand for the words that you can't find. I mean, visual arts in itself as a, as a form, that's when I find that it's the most compelling, most powerful often is when you, you can't find the words to describe what you're looking at. All you know is you feel something from the experience of standing in front of a piece and you recognize that you are faced with something that has changed you. You may not be able to, you may not be able to write some eloquent uh, essay about it, but you, but you know in yourself that you, you are di different from when you showed up and first saw that piece. That, that to me is the power of visual arts. And so it's a challenge sometimes when you, when you have to take that thing and then put it into words. I've worked at it. I've worked at trying to, to figure out how to be more articulate about the objects that I make because I find that there is a kind of framing, a kind of conversation that I can have that will open the door a little bit for other folks to walk in without diminishing their personal experience in front of the work. Because sometimes when, when the artist writes something, particularly as a painter, the painter writes something and then posts it on the wall, then everybody who walks by believes that that is the be all end all. There are no other ways to interpret the thing. And then it blocks them off from their personal um, experience with the work. So uh, yeah. it's just challenging. I think that's the same thing with poets though. Cause you, you, know, you think that the words explain it, but I was thinking you go into an exhibit and you get a text that's trying to describe and explain 15 different pieces, all of which do something in concert, but all of which exist on their own. And, and I just realized actually every time that I've tried to describe a poetry book, I fall into that trap in which a reader might mess around and, and forget that it's, it's like 60 poems in here. Right. And each one of the poems is his own, its own thing. Right. I saw right. an amazing um, passage. I'm reading, um, I am not sure. It's like, I am not sure. Let me see. Because I don't want to get it wrong. It's, I am not your perfect Mexican daughter. Ooh. But, um, by Erica Sanchez. Ooh. And, um, you know, it reminds me, the narrator reminds me of Holden Caulfield. And, and the whole book reminds me of the way in which only some people get to tell stories. Mm -hmm. and, and what I love about this book, though, is uh, that the narrator, she like us, right? She didn't really do great in school. And the narrator is like a 15-year-old kid. But she was really smart. And what's great is how the, the book depicts some of the reasons why she didn't do well in school. Mm -hmm. She goes to a museum. And... uh. And this is probably gonna make sense by the time I finish, I hope. She goes to the museum and, and her sister's died, right? And so that's the like tragedy at the center of the book. But she goes to this museum and she's looking at a painting that she's looked at multiple times. Mm -hmm. And she says, I saw my sister's eyes. Mm -hmm. and, she says, I, and she's like, I, I've seen this painting, you know, dozens of times and never noticed the thing that's in my sister's eyes that I see in this painting and that the paint was reflecting those eyes. And so I guess- um, That's interesting, because that, what that, I, what I wanted you, that no, experience yeah. that you described, I had a very similar experience, which was the moment where I abandoned the idea that my perception of the thing that I make is the only evaluation of the thing, right? I, I 
I prioritize my evaluation of the thing for myself and for my personal experience. But as an artist, there's a way in which you got to let it go once it goes out into the world and it's going to be another thing. Now, I'm going to argue with you when you tell me it's about something I say it's not about. But right. that is not the point is, like, there are other evaluations. So I had my first exhibition in New York and um, there was this painting in the show. And in the painting, there's this woman who her face is blurred out with brush strokes that are like sweeping across the painting. So you can't really see any of her expressions, but her hands are folded like, like this. And her hands are these elderly hands that are aged and weathered and worn. And every wrinkle you see in the surface of her flesh. And so I get to the exhibition. This is my first exhibition in New York. I'm really excited about the exhibition. Literally hundreds of people there. And there's this woman when I walk through the door who's staring down at this one particular painting. I go about my business, I go through the opening, and I come back to that painting. And that woman's still staring at that painting. And the show is ending, and the woman is still staring at that painting. So finally at the end, when everybody's walking out, I walk up to her and I, I say, uh, you know, you've been staring at this painting for, for, for a minute. Like, um, what's going on for you over here? And she looks at me with tears in her eyes and she says, those are my mother's hands. And my mother died recently and I feel like I can't remember her face, but the thing I can't forget is her hands. And so that moment changed how I talk about my work. Because in that moment, do you think I cared what I was thinking about when I made that painting? It doesn't matter. Like I was able to make something that impacted her, that touched her and brought her emotions to the table for her to realize, to see the thing that she was in front of. Completely different and completely separate from my experience of making it. And that is a valuable thing. That's a powerful thing that we get to do as artists. And so I, I recognize in that moment that like I need to be able to make the work, connect to the work and the work in the way that it works for me and then let it go out into the world and step back. And sometimes people are gonna have crazy things to say. Again, I will still argue with you if you say some crazy stuff, but um, I do believe that there is a way for this work to exist on its own outside of us. Let me, let me ask you this other thing then though, cause I, 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 sort, of, I sort of realized too, right? Like uh, when we did this, when we, when we did the redaction, we were really invested in a way in which the mugshot is, 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 is a demeaning like image. And, and, and we brought it to life and you brought it to life one by doing these beautiful portraits, but then two by investing the project into this notion of multiplicity and how, you know, the, the, the figure itself demands to be studied and not written off just because of the frame in which you, you, you meet the figure in. But, but for this one, we, we, we chose not to, and I, I, and I know why we chose not to, but I wonder if, if, if we both might talk about, multiplicity yeah. and and a distinction between um how these folks work so maybe you could do the first part and i'll do the second well before part. you get to that i mean we need to stop fronting like it was like some philosophical theoretical deep conversation um i was stuck in maine <laughs> <laughs> trying, trying to figure out trying to figure out uh what it's like to be a black man in a place where there are no black men and i was like Dwayne, come visit <laughs> And we had our families together. And this project really evolved out of that, out of that experience. So before I get into the multiplicity, why don't you talk about that experience and how that evolved? It's crazy too, because um, <laughs> you could turn anything into a theory, right? And, uh -oh. and the truth is, I forget sometimes, because it all happened so fast, yeah. I forget sometimes that we were like children, like, yo, we got the space. If y'all ain't doing nothing, y'all should come through. Yep. Families can hang out and, and we could go in the studio and mess around. And what's interesting is as we go there and me and you in the studio, and it literally is like children, right? Yeah. Cause cause homie, um, the the the, the guy who Isaac is like, oh yeah, we got some 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 letterpress. And I'm like, letterpress. He's like, Yeah, you know how you do letterpress? And I'm like, you got a typewriter? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so and so then we messing around with the letterpress and actually learning it on our own and yeah. thinking about how how like one of the ways in which you know the, the written word becomes art is thinking about how it can be tactile yeah. and how the presentation of it changes from silk screen to letterpress, changes from embossing 
to D Boss. And then frankly, like, you know, we use the fonts, nine font, nine point font, ten point font. But if you want to put something on a on a 20 by 30 piece of paper, that the actual existence of a 30 point font feels really different when you hold the letter in your hand. Yeah, and so over the course of those two days, we were you know, going through, I had letters from people who did time in prison. You know, you had etchings that you were done. Yep. And we was actually like just sort of in the, in the studio. And you know what makes me mad a little bit? Is some of those tests was like blazed though. Dude, you know, some, some of those tests are still the best things we make. Like, I know. I and, 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 those, those are the best things we make. And that's, I mean, I think that's, that's why like sometimes you just have to be willing to capture everything. Right, because you don't know. You know, I was talking to somebody about this today. Um, you know, sometimes ask me, people ask me this really stupid question, like, um, uh, 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 "How do you know when you're making a masterpiece?" I don't know. I, I don't yeah. know. What you do is you make work. You just make work, and you might stumble upon a masterpiece if you're lucky. But it doesn't happen if you're not making the work. And so, like, that's what happened. We kind of stumbled into the studio. And because we had this freedom to just play, experiment, there was nobody saying, that's not how you use a letterpress. You're not supposed to do it that way. You're supposed to do it this way. We felt this complete freedom to just explore. And I think we came up with something pretty unique that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So anyway, going back to, yeah, so we're in Maine and you know, we both bring our families, we both have two boys, we both bring our families and hang out and just every day just becomes these explorations in the studio and the, the physicality of working with those letters and having to, you know, place every single letter, not type it on a typewriter, not on a keyboard, but to pick up a letter out of a box and place that letter down in this tray and then to like run it physically, turn that bar as you run it through the press. All of that, the physicality was, it for me, is what made that experience pretty great. And you know, all that's pre-redaction. So, so yeah. part, of, yeah. part of the idea redaction came out of thinking about text in that way, came out of thinking about like presenting text as a visual object. And I think it was after that, I get home and I'm working and I'm thinking about this book and I'm thinking about these cases. And I was like, you know, what if we just redacted all of this? You know, cause, yeah. cause actually when you land down text in that way, every word becomes precious and you begin to value Cause we didn't know what we were doing. Yep. So we were laying them down by hand and we were like makeshift in the blocks. Whereas professionals could do it a fair, probably quicker than us Much. and they wouldn't have to do all of the searching, which means that I think that if, if we would been, if we had been more professional going in, I might not have began to value in the same way, how, how precious and communicative like every individual word is. And that was part of doing the redaction pieces. Like, if I go to the redaction part and value that, which one of these words would I keep? Which one would I, would I get rid of? And it wasn't like the way a lot of people do redaction. They think that I, I want to revise the text, you know? Yeah. I want to get rid of what is, uh, I want to make it say something it didn't mean to say or want to say. For yeah. me, it's always like, how do you turn this really complicated, rich language into a poem that says what you actually want it to say and what it wants to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's a part of it is like, some of it is like trying to figure out what that, what that document, what that painting, what that poem wants to say. But going back to the multiplicity thing for a second, I mean, for me, originally working with multiple faces on top of each other was about privacy, about making sure that the faces, the portraits that I was working on, um, that it wasn't really about uh, putting those folks on glass. Right. right. You know, no, they, they didn't ask to be a part of my project, particularly when I started the Jerome project. That was an exploration of, you know, the criminal justice system through the name Jerome. And I found all these dudes who had the exact same first and last name as my father. And I found them on those horrible databases that exist in the world. And I just felt like I needed to do something with it. And so when I started making these drawings, I, it's funny because I got one on the wall over here. Um, when I started making the, I'm tempted to go get it. Um, when I started making those drawings, I, I was putting one face on top of another to say two things. One, I don't want the individual to be put on blast, like I said, but also I want to understand that this is happening for lots of people. 
And these stories and begin to meld together. When we talk about the folks that you're helping get out of prison, sometimes it's like this detail in this story, story A is the same as the detail in story B. Right. And you're like, man, this shit just keeps going on and on and on. It keeps happening, happening, happening. So um, that's what the multiplicity was it origin originally. But in the stuff that we're doing here, um, it, you know, there is a honor to the portraiture it, that it, and a um, and we in this particular case we want to recognize the individuals. We want the individuals to be known. We have we've received their permission in a very different way. You know, I, it's two points. One, I'm gonna read you this poem. I ain't even realized this. Mm. I can't even remember when I wrote this. It's in my last book. So you probably heard, I know you read it, but no letters distinguish my father's name from my own. Mm. No signal for the mailman, the postman, my employer. The man before them is me and not what follows after grief. We are no goldfinch, instead a kind of crow, a murder of us looming. And then check this, search our history and find felonies and divorce proceedings. Mm. The online account of our background, a song of tragedy and regret. And this is the line right here. A dozen men with portions of our name, variations and fragments. Cause you know, it was the, it's the same riff, right? Mm. It's like me, my pops. And then it, it'd always be like, like Reginald M. Betts or Reginald P. Betts or something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. But it was all portions and variations of the same story. And all these folks was in Maryland. So it's like, I could have did the same thing in every state and got some iteration. But, but the yeah. other point though, which is how, you know, cause people do shit just to do it. And I think what was cool about the redaction piece, and then we'll shift to this one, is the redaction piece these were class action lawsuits. Right. And so the multiplicity also right. suggested the multiplicity of plaintiff. Right. And it was like, you know, this was an actual city that this was happening to, you know, this wasn't one person that was being reduced. And for me, when we switched it up on this one, part, part of me was like, well, if we're doing a mural, man, I could be on the side of a building, you know? <laughs> part of me was like, we should just use our faces, right? <laughs> and, and, but then the other part of me, was was like who gets to be Philly, yeah. You know, and and, yeah. and 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 like who gets to be like really proud of, and they were there from the beginning, yeah. You know, in terms of like being a part of the project the whole time, it was like they get to they get to represent Philly, Philly, and 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 honestly, the other piece, and that I'm just gonna reveal this about your work is that this is another riff on your work though, because when you're doing this portraiture and you're remixing and revising and rethinking these um older pieces to change the frame, you frequently use in models that's contemporary folks. And it's like an inside coda, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that I know who that is featured in that piece and nobody else might know. And I feel like we did the same thing here. Like you go yeah. into the into the joint and they'd be like, I don't know who them dudes are, but those folks, their families like, yeah, that's me there. Yeah. And, and I think it creates another compelling narrative about who gets the matter in individual arts, in the visual space, in the museum. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, that interview that um, our mothers did of each other. Uh, yeah, your yeah. Mother talks about, your mother talks about the painting that I did of Makai when he was little and, and put him into, um, into the, the uh, what was it painting? The Yale painting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah enough about you. And it, it, it's interesting because, yeah, no, most people don't look at that painting and go, oh, that's, that's Reginald Dwayne Betts' son, right? Right. But when it, when uh, when Grandma looks at that painting, she's like, "That's my baby, right?" So right. yeah, you're right. It is like this sort of secret thing that's in there. But the reality is like that that has been happening in the history of painting forever, right? So when you think about the um, when you think about the Battle of Bunker Hill, the painting of the Battle of Bunker Hill by Trumbull, um, are those the actual characters in that painting? No. Even if you think about the signing of the Declaration of Independence. When Trumbull went around the country trying to find people for models, if the if the founding father wasn't alive, then he just painted the next of kin, right? And so we've been <laughs> using seriously, seriously. So we've been using stand-ins to represent these people for ages. But when we when we look at those paintings, we feel like those paintings are representative of a kind of a true a true history, a reality, or not a fact, 
and it's not fact. It's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a manipulation um, to help us understand, to try to help us get to a truth, um, not necessarily a fact. Yeah, see, I didn't realize that. Um, I, I think it's compelling even in, in different ways to think that like, yeah, given that it's a fact that we create is like a decision, the kind of decisions that we make about our art, about who will be represented. I know, I know folks might wonder like, well, why the Declaration of Independence? And, and I, I worked in Philly for a year. And man, you know, you work as a, I was a federal law clerk on the Third Circuit, which just to just explain it to people, you know, you got the Supreme Court and then that's the top court in the country. So you got state and federal courts. Right. And on a state level, you got like a law court and then you got a Supreme Court. And you might have an intermediate court, court too, like a court of appeals. But on the federal level where I work, you got the district courts and no service trial courts and no service the first courts if you wanna like sue somebody, right? Um, and, and then you got the court of appeals and it's, you know, each sort of region has a circuit. So I've worked on the third circuit and then right above us is the Supreme Court. And so I worked there and we would get all kinds of cases. You know, we would get cases where, I think get wild cases, honestly. We get cases where somebody is suing an eye doctor and the case got filed and then it got appealed and it made it to us. We would get cases where, you know, we got one case, actually one of the more proud cases I was to work on it was somebody who had gotten sentenced to a bunch of time in prison and he had filed pro se, which means he didn't have a lawyer, challenging his sentence. And, um, and it was, I was really proud to work on that case because the issue was complicated. And, and if he would have been in front of a different three judges, he might've had to do you know, the 50, 60, 70 months that he got sentenced to mm -hmm. as opposed to getting the, the case um, thrown out. But what was interesting is I'm, I'm working there and I'm looking out over the Delaware River every day and I'm looking and I can see the, the Liberty Bell and I'm looking at my motions and the motions will be these like basically legal filings asking for people to have their criminal cases reviewed. And, and like day in and day out, man, I would look at these motions and they would unfailingly lose. Mm. And, and I realized though, in looking at these motions and looking at the appeals, the criminal cases, that most people absent a strong legal claim because most folks didn't have objectively a strong legal claim. And, and, it, and that's just sort of is what it is. It's like a lot of folks, their claim was, I have been locked up too long and I should be free. And what was, what was devastating about working there in some ways was um, these petitions unfailingly, unfailingly lost. Mm. You know, it's just that I was, I maybe was a part of a couple that were successful. Mm. And, and when I say I was a part of them, I wasn't there as an advocate. I was there as like a, a, a fake ass judge. You know, I worked for the judge. I was there to like evaluate the claim. Mm. And it would break my heart when I had to say, there's no legal claim here. Mm. And the point was hitting on the declaration was like, what they were really doing is trying to write their own declaration of independence. They were trying yeah. to assert yeah. that they wanted freedom. And, yeah, and so, so do, you have, do you have that um, PDF of the paintings? I want you to click through yeah, yeah. the paintings. Pull, pull it up. The one with the uh, uh, Washington on horseback. Not that one. That's redaction yeah. project. Right. Here. That, 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 that. So it's really interesting because when when people see that this is at the Yale Art Gallery, when people see this painting, they inevitably always invariably think that the document that's on the cover or in front of George Washington's face is the Declaration of Independence. And it's not, it's not the Declaration of Independence. What it is, is um, George Washington's so-called slave ledger. And it's a document that lists all of the people that were enslaved on his plantation. And so I took this historical painting of George Washington and the slave ledger and, and na literally nailed them together, nailed that document to the surface, and, and essentially saying, we have to have both of these conversations at one time. And it creates this amendment to this historic painting. And in the same way, the redaction of the, of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, these kinds of documents become their own kinds of amendments. And we have to amend, we have to amend these documents if we wanna include ourselves because these documents historically have forgotten about us. So in this painting's case, the amendment happens through physically, literally nailing this 
this document to the surface of the canvas with all of these names on the surf uh, on on the canvas itself. But in in the document case, we do it through through redaction. And what, but what's wild to me though is, is every time I come to the, to the, go to the museum and I see this, I think I think you know some people will read it saying, um, "Are you trying to erase Washington?" And it's like, no, that's not the point. The point is to to reveal different levels of it. So I'm gonna show this one. Just fast forward before we um we go to um to the Q and A. I want to show this space, and you can look at one difference between this space here, in which the intention was to read these poems and and, and view these images as singular and as a part of a sequence. Um, this is the next haven space. This is the next haven space. But I wanted people to look at this one and think about how the assertion here is really that these names, these faces, these people, they all have voice mm. in creating the freedom that this document is asserting. It is not meant to erase the document. It's meant to highlight aspects of the document that folks might not have felt was, mm. uh, was prominent. Mm. And mm. so it's not like, like Washington still gets to be there. Yeah, Just yeah, like yeah. in life, he was there around 300 people who he enslaved. Yeah. In the portrait, he gets to be there in the same way. And it's sort of like an echo and a memory. And I think some folks are afraid of, um, in fact, it's a poem by Lucille Clifton. And it says, um, I'm, I'm, I'm about to butcher it, so I apologize to people who know this poem. But it says, um, people keep asking me to remember things. And they're mad because I remember like my history and not the history they want me. I'm, I've ruined that poem. I'm gonna look it up so I can fix it. I just ruined that poem. But but the whole idea is of of, of uh, the probably artist. listening right now. Well, I know she's not, but her folks is listening. They might be. But I just like the whole thing is you know, the job of the artist is to um, is to remember. Mm. And and I think it's a is I think it's, it's actually like a a really complicated duty. And actually, before we go to questions, I wanted to, because I think about this a lot, like as a, as a poet and as a dude that did time and as an essayist, people keep wanting me to remember their memories. And I wonder, hmm. how do you address that? Because as a visual artist, like they just want me to be that jukebox. Hmm. And, and, and I suppose as a visual artist, you know, people, I, I feel like people will want to push you into those same, those same spaces where they want you to, um, you know, to, to create their version of the world or their version of protest. And I wonder how you resist yeah. that well. So yeah. I just wonder how you resist that. It, it's interesting because I, I don't think my answer is actually going to answer the question, but I just feel like, uh, I feel like I want to make this thing public. Basically, I had this conversation with this dealer that I worked with in Europe uh, yesterday. And um, I'm not going to go through the whole conversation with the dealer, but uh, he has some of my work in Europe. The show is doing what the show is doing. It's doing relatively well. People like it. They're writing about it, whatever. Um, but he says to me, he says, um, you know, Titus, you are a phenomenal painter. You're fantastic. You're innovative, blah, 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 butter in the oven. And then he goes, you know, it would be so much easier to sell your work if you just didn't talk so much about the politics and black people. And, you know, we all know that that's there. We all know that's there, but like, when you do interviews, if you could just more talk about your painting, um, I think it would make my life a lot easier in terms of selling, selling work. And, 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 and I'm gonna let you hear it, because Duane, I literally recorded the conversation. Um, but my answer was basically, why do, I, why do I care that that makes it easy for you? Like, essentially, this is not about you. This is about me, me having to deal with the things that I need to deal with the way that I need to deal with them. And if you oh. can't sell it, give me my stuff back. I'm doing all right. So oh, this, is, this, is a, this is the coda, because this is a, so, so the Lucille Clifton poem, and it, like Clifton is one of my favorite, mm -hmm. my favorite poets. I mean, I'm, a, um, I, I'm, I'm like the new poetry edit, editor for the New York Times Magazine. This is the first time I said that publicly, but, uh, and I'm honored to do it, but you know, the first person's work that I'm publishing, the first poem I'm publishing is by Lucille Clifton, and she passed, and um, you know, great artist though, right, and, and it kind of, I like to think of her as like one of those like great exceptional regular folks like like I think of like Lucille Clifton and like uh like Bill Withers mm. you know somebody who's doing something exceptional that you could imagine yourself doing it even if you recognize it's just out of reach mm. and uh, so her poem is called why some people be mad at me sometimes 
and you should send this to this 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 guy in Europe, right? Because it's like they ask me to remember, but they want me to remember their memories, mm. and I keep on remembering mine. And and it's the same thing, you know. I love that man. They, they want me to create, but they want me to create their art. Yeah. You know. Yeah. They want me to tell their stories. Yeah. Not recognizing, and this is even even the people we love. It's like I'm sorry, but you don't you can't dictate the story that I'm telling. No. no. Today, yesterday, or tomorrow. No, I mean now, that was one of the things I said to him. I said, if you come to me and say you don't want to talk about the politics, that's what I want to talk about. If you come to me and say you don't want to talk about the form and the composition and the uh, art historical value to the work, then that's what I want to talk about. I said it has to be both. I'm not one dimensional like that. I'm trying to do multiple things. So if you cannot have both of those conversations in this relationship problem, I don't want to. Yeah. Well, All right, let's get to these um, questions. Yeah, let's see if people got some questions. Who work is that behind you, Titus? Oh, um, that, that's Vaughn Spann, one of our next Haven artists. I like that. That eye, that eye is real subtle. He's a, he's, he's a beast, man. He's a beast. Is that an eye? That's an eye and an X, right? What are you talking about? It looks like an actual eyeball in the lower corner of the X. Yeah, no, man, you seeing things. I'm certain that those are eyes. I'm certain because I'm sitting behind it, in front of it. There's no eye. I promise you. Look, look, look. See, no eye. You just see a reflection. Where are these questions, man? I, I think, I think one of the tragedies of um. Us. Did you get that question? Here. Please yeah. Two. Um. I missed the name of the piece with George Washington. What do you call it and what inspired you to paint it? Um, Shadows of Liberty. Um, and what inspired me to paint it was I was doing research on my family's history. Um, my mother has always said that our family hailed from Mount Vernon Plantation. Um, there's no historical documentation of that. It's just kind of like family lore. And so I started looking um, in George Washington's um, memoirs, catalogs, historical documents to try to see if I could find any family names and of my family names. And when I started doing this research, um, it became very clear to me that it wasn't about my family. Um, there are about there are multiple hundreds of families whose freedom was taken from them on that plantation. And so uh, it turned out that there's a possibility, maybe one of our family members came from there. But that research is what inspired me to actually make the thing. I'm going to stop by saying that, too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can just make, you can make stuff up. My family does it all the time. Here we have another question. Um, just like someone would want you to take the politics out of the context of your work in order to feel safe, how do you feel about collectors owning your work who just want to have popular works by contemporary black artists? Does the lack of control over these situations feel like they draw power from the piece? That's a really interesting ending. Do I feel like the lack of the con control draws power from the piece? If the piece has power, then, then no. If the piece has power, then then the owner can't take that out of it. It's something like deeply imbued into the core of the piece and it transfers from the maker to the object. And I can't see a scenario where someone owning that thing could take it out of it. I see it maybe more as a possibility of a kind of like Trojan horse. I think of myself as making things where uh, they're not pretty pictures that sit, sit on walls. You can't just, you can't just walk by and be like, oh, that's nice. Um, there's a hole in that painting. That painting shredded. There's tar all over that painting. Um, you're going to have to have a conversation about this thing. I do, um, as, as my career grows, I'm not, I, I haven't fully resolved the issue of the fact that at a certain point in my career, um, only wealthy white people are able to afford what I buy. 
that's the majority. Like, it's not only, but it's the majority of the people who buy what I buy. I mean, but that's why we don't have redaction books. That's though. why we, I, I well, think, that's one of the reasons. That's one of the reasons, but that's the other, the other part of that is I, part of the reason why I, I prioritize institutions and museums because I want to make things public. I want to make sure that the community is able to engage and see these things. So I always prioritize um, doing that. But then, you know, I say this all the time, my clarity on this piece actually came from my mother. Um, uh, when my mother said to me, she said, uh, uh, you need to think of this as reparations. So it's not a question. <laughs> That's just my mom. It's not a question. Do that too. It's, not, it's not a question of those rich people. It's a question of what are you gonna do with the money that you got? And so that's the next haven. That's the reason why I'm doing next haven because the 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 money that I get from these projects allow me to bring money back into the community and do things that actually affect change. And so I get to I, I feel I mean how could I possibly complain about being an individual who makes my living from doing what I love from making from making paintings? It's complicated. I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but yeah, uh, mom told me to think about it as reparations, and that's how I've been doing. But and also though it's, it's a value point though, right? Like I, I, you know, got a piece from a couple folks that said Next Haven, and yeah. and the truth is like you know five years from now I probably couldn't afford the same things I own right now. Yeah. And and the other piece of it is that um. I wouldn't have those pieces had you not built Next Haven, and and I think that you know I, I get the sentiment behind the question, and I fully understand it. But we don't ask we don't ask writers that. Mm. So so what, what mm. I get paid to go give a talk at you know, at Yale, the, the local elementary school can't pay me to get the same talk. Right. And, and when I show up at the elementary school and I give my time, like nobody equates that, that thing is me making sure that I'm showing up in both places. And nobody asks me, should I not give the talk at, at like, you know, whatever university could pay me, whatever they pay me, right? Yeah. Should I not give the talk there because I am only accessible to that audience because yeah. of their ability to pay and fly me out and put me up in a hotel. Yeah, yeah, you know, it becomes yeah, yeah. the same narrative. And, and so I think about your art as, as, as both the art that you create and us running the quarantine camp and teaching yeah. our children how to produce art. Like, I don't want to limit the things we produce to the things that folks recognize as being bought and sold. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that our art Absolutely. is a little bit Absolutely. more expensive than that. Absolutely. I was pitched. I mean, you gave one of our good friends. I was like, how are you going to give such and such the piece for his birthday, I wanted that piece. You know what I mean? Or, or like, or like when we donated the piece to the local community organization, yeah. so that it was part of the fundraiser. Like yeah. people, the public aren't hearing that and aren't seeing that. But that was a piece that we could have sold for money. And so I yeah. think that our work is existing in different spaces, and I know your work is existing in different spaces. And it's not just it's it's on a fucking billboard. I mean, it's gonna be on the side of a wall. Europe. <laughs> It's like, you know, that is like the most expensive, you know, in, in terms of size, scale, and scope, you know, and that joint is free to the public. So I, I think that's that, important. Um, that's important. That, 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 you know, yes, it's a serious question and it's a legitimate question, but sometimes just focusing on that question misses out on all of the ways in which we make our work and our presence, um, you know, open to, to, to yeah. wide swaths of people who don't pay for it. Yeah, I hear that. Yeah, I was, that was going to be my question because it's like we're in a city where you turn almost every corner and you see a work of public art. It's like a, a city that's an outdoor museum accessible to everybody yeah. and created by, by people from here and representing people who live here. So what does it mean to you to do this, to, you know, to, to do a mural and, is, and, you know, yeah, that's my question. For me, uh, I yeah. feel like, um, you know, we, we live in a city, Dwayne and I live in a city right now that, uh, just does not have enough public art. It's, it, it, it's, it's shocking how little public art is in the city of New Haven. It makes no sense to me. Public sculptures, murals, or anything, anything like that. For me, having the work outside is an act of democracy. Um, it's, it goes back to that question of the idea that we can't, you know, everyone can't own this object that I make, but when you do a mural, everyone, can own that. Everyone can participate in the benefits of the power of art in public spaces. So, I mean, that to me, I think that that's a, it's a, it's a pretty special thing, particularly in this moment right now. Yeah. Well, thank you. You know, I think it's exciting. I think, um, I think I learned 
also about the sort of production of the, of the mural and how it creates an opportunity to expand expertise. Because, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. y'all ain't called me to be like, yeah, so it's time to put the mural up. Can you bring your ladder? You know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm learning how, how like sophisticated the process of creating the mural and, and doing it in a way that it lasts for more than a few hours. You yeah. know, I think it's a, I think it's a kind of beauty just to the idea of it and to the concept of it and the way in which you ask the city to, to stare at something beautiful, mm -hmm. even if it's just for like a, a second, you know, we live in this world in which um, we don't get the opportunity to like stare at something beautiful enough. So yeah. I, I, I dig it. You know, I'm, I'm honored that we, we get to, I'm, I could show up with my kids and be like, yo, we did that. Yeah. yeah. I'm a ladder. I'm going to be like, I climbed on the ladder. <laughs> How y'all do that? I was on the ladder. <laughs> I had to you're on the scaffolding. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think it's great. We're in a city with a waiting list of several thousand people who want murals. I mean, what does that say? That's so That's like, amazing. yeah, exactly. Okay, here's another question. Um, uh, okay, I teach high school. Oh, I teach high school right outside of Philly, mostly black students who don't often feel heard in the world. I don't want to ask the trait, what would you tell them in terms of making your voice heard, but I'm not sure how to rephrase it. What would you want to say to these young people? Yeah, I don't, um, so first I think it's two points. It's about being heard and about being seen. And, and um, it was fascinating about that book, I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican American Daughter or Your Perfect Mexican Daughter by Erica Sanchez. It's, it does a really good job of, you know, she got in trouble a lot for talking too much to the narrator. And she talks about this one teacher um, asking him what their favorite word is and then talking about language with him. And, and, and the whole, and, she, and he said, uh, I'm going to teach you hundreds of words this, this, this year. And the words aren't meant for you to pass a test or anything. The words are meant to give you access to a way of communicating and to, and to the kind of language, um, the kind of power that comes with being able to say something well. And, uh, and she has said something like wisteria. And she writes that I felt like he really noticed me because he listened to, to what I said and then helped all of us understand why this was a thing of value. I think sometimes when you're teaching in a public school, you get caught up in the desire to teach these lessons that you don't get a chance to take the opportunity to like actually see a student. And, and I think seeing a student is the first step towards hearing a student. And the truth is, you know, you're trying to teach somebody how to multiply, it's not real room to see them. It, it takes like a real skill and intention to try to see them. And then to try to hear them, it takes even more. And sometimes it's just acknowledging that the, the classroom might not be the space for them to be heard. And so you nurture other spaces where they could go to be heard. I think about like Next Haven, if I was a teacher here in New Haven, I would, I would tell my students about Next Haven because I would, I would recognize that, listen, Maybe we don't have room here for you to be heard or for you to develop the skills to be heard. Like I'm teaching you social studies. I'm sorry. I, I don't care about the fact that you just read this or saw this TED talk. Today, I just got to teach you social studies, but you can stay after school and we could chop it up. Or you want to be an artist, you doodling in my class. I believe in your art, but this ain't the time for it. I'm supposed to teach you to multiply, but here's next saving. And so I think we just need to be more attentive to the spaces that exist where we can filter our students so that they can be heard. You know, I, I taught in a creative writing program. I taught poetry to seventh and eighth graders. And all my students felt heard. Even the ones I was like, yo, what's going on? Why are you so angry today? You know, it's because you're eating candy. You gotta, that sugar makes people <laughs> angry. You gotta stop it. And even just joking with this little kid like that made her feel heard because it was like, I recognized that she was coming in with something on her mind. But I could do that because my job was to teach her poetry, not to teach her multiplication. Yeah. You know, I think, I think the challenge in, in that question is like, um, it, it, is I can't answer it because I don't know the institution. I don't know what the sort of structural parameters around your teaching is. I don't know what the pedagogy or philosophy of the school is. And so what I will say is, I know a lot of folks who felt that way all the way up into graduate school, felt unheard. Um, and particularly just thinking about uh, in arts programs, even at Yale. 
Um, and so for me, uh, the solution was um, setting up a new institution, uh, a new institution where I could create the parameters that made sure that folks got heard. That's, you know, that was starting, starting from scratch. It's not to say that there's no way to do what this teacher is asking. I mean, and the fact that she's asking the question um, leads me to believe that at least, at the very least, her heart is certainly in the right place. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, you know, depending on what the structures and the powers that be, uh, my mother works in a, in a public school back, back home in Michigan, and she, is, uh, she works with the students who um, have uh, disabilities. That's her, that's her focus. And we're always talking about how she's not getting the kind of support that she needs um, from this principal, from the staff, and things like that. So uh, it's it's a hard question. It's a hard question to answer, honestly. How did you get from community college to Yale? I always wondered that. I always wondered, like, like we've had these conversations and we talk about students, and and, and it's really interesting because I think that we both. Wait, share hold on. You went to community college too. What are you talking about? Yeah, no. Stop but running. I, Stop running. <laughs> <laughs> I know where you come from. I know where you but come from. It's so funny though, right? Because like. You talk about like being heard, being seen, and making it to different pl yeah. places, right? I also think part of it is like the whole possibility of it. Because yeah. I'm certain it, you, like me, nobody, when we were like enrolling, taking these classes at the local community college, nobody said, well, you should have your eyes set on Yale. No, no. And you know, I mean, <laughs> the truth is, the truth is, um, I, I mean, this is a ridiculous thing to say. You know, I'm one of the first persons in our family to go to college. So like Yale was not on my radar. I'm from you know Michigan growing up, and then moved out to California. But like when my undergrad professor uh, suggested that I apply to graduate school, and he 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 said Yale, I literally said, "What's that?" <laughs> and that dude just he just he just laughed at me because he thought I was joking. He thought I was joking. I was like. I, don't, I, I mean, is that a good, is that a good school? Like, where, where is that? Um, and the point is, my world was so disconnected, disconnected from academia. That was not something that I was ever considering or thinking about. And as I told you before, only reason I went to junior college was because I was trying to impress Julianne, my wife. Uh, I wanted to go on a date with her and she was like you're not thinking about your future so i went down registered for some classes and they came back that's really it that's there was no i mean people think that's a joke but i my interest was in her it wasn't really interesting in school i take these classes i understand through these classes that i like really have an affinity towards visual understanding of the world and i've never had anybody require that understanding of me i take our history class and everything goes from there i get a i get a um a B in that class, which is a revelation for me. It's never happened before. Um, and I realized that if I use these other visual strategies for learning, I can do a lot better. And so um, one of my, my counselors at the junior college said, you know, your grades are decent. You can actually transfer over to the state school. And so I was like, cool, okay, I'll do that. And then I transferred over to the state school, started taking more art history classes over at the state school. And that was going well. And then you know, I ended I up on hilarious. what? I find it hilarious because, like, I took art history once and it ruined my life. Like, <laughs> I was just like, "What in the world?" That's why you're a writer that? now. That's, that's why you're a writer now. I, art history's not, not for everybody. It's definitely not for everybody. No, I find that fascinating. I find even hearing that story important in terms of like a student being being heard. Yeah. Sometimes a student being heard is exposing them. And exposing yourself to the thing that allows you to like right. tap into that frequency right. that that lets you actually like hear the thing that they're saying because right. i wouldn't have never thought it possible and i know I, I think we got at least one more question i think is a really good one we should both answer it what is it it's it's about um i want to answer it as a writer and and it's about like which one's that that's the i i have a black woman with two granddaughters who have begun painting and and actually, this is for Makai too, because I don't I don't really know. I mean, I, I know what I told him, which is to call Titus, but he's still like, man, I ain't going. To call <laughs> yeah, he's supposed to be. We're supposed to have a conversation about abstraction, and he has not yeah. back to me. He, I gotta, I gotta get on him. He, he shook too. Like, he ain't. You know what? You know how it is. But the question is, what can I do to help the, these two granddaughters? We don't know how old they are, but what can I do to help them grow in their art? Mm. 
I mean, a couple of things. I think the, the first thing is let them see every bit of art they can possibly see. Let them see as much art as they can possibly see. Expand their world in it. And then access to materials. I mean, I think a lot of times what happens, um, I, I'm really different. I didn't find my interest in visual arts until really, really late. I'm in my 20s, you know, I'm in my mid to mid 20s before I realized that I want to be a painter. Um, a lot of people start when they're kids, like, oh, I know what I want to do when I grow up. I want to be, I want to be an artist. I want to paint. That's not what I, what I did. So what happens, I find, because I taught elementary art um, through the museum and different things like that. Um, parents see a kid who is really, really interested in the arts. And so their first thing is to sort of like institutionalize it. Um, and they, put, they end up putting too many parameters around it and the freedom that the child got from the art experience, they don't get anymore. And so just finding ways to support the kid in the way that they want to do the work, right? It doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, maybe they, they want to do an art class. Okay, so let them do an art class. Or maybe they don't. Maybe they just want to sit in their room and make these paintings. Just let them see as much as they can possibly see. Expose them to art that reflects their, their themselves, right? So you have two, two, uh, two daughters. Um, you know, they should, be, they should be looking at all the art they can possibly find, but you should certainly um, look at uh, Nina Chanel Abney. You should certainly look at uh, Micheline Thomas. Um, those contemporary black women making art right now, uh, you should certainly look at Injadeka. Uh, you should certainly, like knowing, I think it's important for them to know that there are black women in the world who are killing it in the art. Yeah. so that they can envision themselves in those same positions. I think that's what, that's what I would suggest. And I would have said the same answer for writing. So if you got somebody that wants to be a poet, wants to be a writer, doesn't know what kind of writer they want to do, I would just be like, encourage them to write and, 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 and feed them books and expose them to all kinds of writing. Because, you know, if you, if you rely on the school to do it, you, it's a certain, like, a, a, a very large bandwidth of contemporary artists that they just won't have exposure to. Right. And it's artists from the, the 60s who were like really prominent in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s that like no school is gonna hip you to. And you don't wanna be, yeah. like if they're interested at 12 and 13, they, they don't wanna know who, they don't wanna have to wait until college to find out who Albert Murray is mm. or Pauli Marshall. Mm -hmm. You know, mm. it's just like, you don't wanna wait that long. You, you wanna know who Lucille Clifton is or Nikki Giovanni or Sonia Sanchez like you want to head at a part of their vocabulary yeah. um, right now. And to yeah. think about how art and, and literature is a way in which, you know, you can actually um, develop a language to understand the world. But the other thing for art though, is like young people need to know that there's some other black artists besides Basquiat. Now I love Basquiat, don't get me wrong, but it needs to be known that there are other black artists who are out there making art and who, you know, didn't die of drug overdose. Here's a question yeah. from Facebook. Um, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote in the Criteria of Negro Art that all art is propaganda. Do you agree with this statement? Please let us know your reasoning for what he wants. Is that Jason Stanley? Is that? There's no, there's no. Uh, that's Jason Stanley. <laughs> Dwayne, Dwayne, I think that's Jason. I think that's. I, I don't even know how to answer that. I mean, I. Yeah, I don't know how to answer that. I think, I, I think, I think, one, I'm, I'm just going to say no. I'm just going to say no. But, but the re real reason why I'm going to say no is because, um, because propaganda is, is, is really a mechanism of the person who, who is trying to make meaning of the art. And that's not necessarily the same um, kind of decision that the artist is making. It's some art that's obviously propaganda, but to say all art is propaganda is just, um, it's just evidence that sometimes even Du Bois gets it wrong. That's all, you know. <laughs> I think, um, I think, I think if, if the point is to say that all art has um, not only a, uh, a formal language, but it also has a political implication, um, I would agree with that. But I think when you just say propaganda, that, that word is now, 
um, wrapped up in so much of the meaning. I know what it means. I know what it means. But I think, I think how I would probably say it is all art has formal implications and also has um, political implications um, as well. You, gotta, you, you might have to dig a little bit when you're looking at a Donald Judd um, and you're looking at a, a, a big steel blue square um, trying to figure out what the, what the implications, the political implications of that are. Um, but um, if we have more time, I can talk to you about what they are. There. But, I, but I, I, I still think though, I still think even if you go with the basic definition of propaganda, it gets to the point that you just say, um, it just becomes such a generalization. I'm, I'm just definitely afraid of generalizations. Yeah. And I yeah, think yeah. most people recognize propaganda as somehow having a, a, a mechanism or underpinning that, that, that intends to mislead people or sway people to a certain point of view? I think sway, I think sway. But, 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 but doing it in such a way that's, that's, that's like maybe even independent of the intention of the art though. And, and, and that's why you say all art is propaganda. I mean, that's really, that's, that's really, I just, what, what are we, what, what are we trying and what political viewpoint are we trying to support in the art that we create when it's like fully complicated and that's the reason why artists aren't featured at the Democratic National Convention. I mean, that's the they reason tried. why- They tried, they tried. The they know? definitely tried. Yeah, they it's definitely like, tried. But no, no thank you. Um, yeah, no, I hear what you're saying though. I mean, I think anytime you get into, particularly with art, but anytime you get into all art is whatever, um, there's gonna be an artist out there in the world who tries to make something to challenge that notion. Um, uh, purposely or unconsciously, um, yeah. but I but but I definitely think it's worth is is worth having a debate. Is there any more questions? Because I think we're I have one. Done. Just Jesse Crimes wants to know, uh, Dwayne, can you read a portion of your redacted declaration series? He'd love to hear the poem. The, uh, sure, I will say. Um, I read a portion of it. I say the challenge with reading a portion of it is that I end up wanting to read the whole thing. But also the challenge with it is I think that you should hear both of them at the same time. But I think it's important to hear the first few lines. So I read the first few lines. When necessary, it's two challenges. I'm gonna be frank about this last challenge. I really intended this to be both like visual and, and based on the words. And so when you look at it, the handwriting is beautiful but it's not the easiest thing to read at all. And so as I read it right now, I'm not as practiced reading it because this cursive is, they just made letters different in 1776. So, um, so it's, it's a whole nother thing about paying attention um, that exists with this piece that doesn't exist if I was reading something that I typed up. When necessary to dissolve powers of the earth, separate, and equal the laws of nature, of nature's God. Respect requires the cuffs, the separation. We hold these truths. All men are created. Life, liberty, these rights, these rights, powers, causes to suffer along a train of abuses. And I'll stop. Thank you. So um, a huge thank you to uh, Titus and Dwayne. Uh, Titus, if there's any way we can be value added, um, doing some murals with you. We'd love to collaborate. Any way we can help bring a public Can you do any in New Haven? Yeah, we work around the country. We have a mural. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's do that. Okay. Let's definitely do You're that. You're on. We're doing it. Okay, great. Um, I want to um, thank the African American Museum for hosting this wonderful show. Uh, Jesse Primes for your curation. Uh, please go to the website to see this exhibit, everybody. Um, please. It, the work is incredible. And uh, we're currently working on bringing uh, a lot of new murals to the city that are connected with this exhibit. Uh, all the, the art, the public art and the work in the show is made possible because of Art for Justice. They are visionary funders and we need more funders like them. 
uh, the world would be a better place. We also want to thank the National Endowment for the Arts for their support and the city of Philadelphia. And remember everyone that art is important, it matters, and it can ignite change and transformation. And we just heard from two extraordinary people. Thank you so much, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.